Hey, and welcome everybody to the, today's episode of Shop and Invest. I have my good friend Chris Naga on with us today. We're going to be talking about money, the truth about money, some of the myths about money, and how you can get back control of your money. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing awesome. How about yourself? I'm doing good, man. I am back in Puerto Rico. I was in Michigan for a few weeks in the cold like you. And uh, let's just say I'm happy to be back home, 80 degrees outside, you know, enjoying the beach, enjoying the weather. And, uh, you know, looking to get control of my money, man. So uh, definitely, definitely. How's it going in Buffalo? Uh, You know, it was going good until last week when the weather turned. And tomorrow we have a winter storm advisory. So that's how it's going here in Buffalo. Other than that, as long as I don't go outside, I'm good to go. I saw somebody talk about that today. Like, There's like going to be snow. Like six inches of snow. And I just want everybody that's listening to this kind of know the the kind of whole dynamic of that. Two weeks ago, not even, it was 80 degrees out. So we're going from 80 to now a winter storm advisory. Welcome to (laughs) Buffalo, New York. Why would anyone want to live here is my question. Yeah, you know, that reminds me, um, I used to live in the UP, right? So the UP is the Upper upper Peninsula of Michigan. And you probably know where it's at, but, you know, the UP is when you're – you're on the um the lake. You're on Lake Superior, right? And so, like, they would get snow. I mean, they'll probably get a snowstorm, you know, probably in May. They'll probably still get a snowstorm. You know, that's just how it is up there. So, you're on Lake Erie, right, in Buffalo? Yeah. Yeah. So, that lake effect snowman is something different. Like, it definitely is. That's for sure. It's definitely different, all right? <laughs> so, what we're going to talk about today, man, we're going to talk about money, the truth about money, and how to control your money, right? We've been going through this little series with Chris once a month. I'm so happy, you know, you've been able to come on. Um, I've been a big proponent of be your own bank, of, of uh, you know, infinite banking policy, but just in general, just controlling your money, right? Because all that stuff ties into us trying to get control of our money again, you know, grasp it away from the banks and the Fed and the government and everybody else who just wants to waste it, right? So we've been talking about, you know, using the policy for our own real estate deals. Last time we talked about, you know, financing your company car through your policy. Today we want to just have a discussion, right? Just, let's just talk about money, right? Talk about some of the you know, the ways to capture that money back, you know, just kind of open it up and and just kind of be more interactive today. So I'm looking forward to today's, uh, today's talk. Yeah. And I think it's important sometimes just to get back to the core fundamentals of, you know, the lies we've been told our whole lives about money and, and what we've been brought up to believe is true about money where it's really not. And I think just, you know, having an open discussion about that, about how money really works and about what the wealthy do with money, why they do what they do, and why we're taught to do the complete opposite. You know, I, I just did a video. It's not on YouTube yet, but it's going to be a good one. And it was, you know, why is it that the banks do something with their money that is the complete opposite of what they tell us to do with ours? In other words, if I were to walk into the bank and I, let's just say I had a big deposit, just like this money I'm holding. And I, I went to the bank and I went to the teller and I said, listen, I have all this money and I would love to put this money with your bank, but I want you to put my money exactly where the bank puts its money. And the, the sad part about that is the bank could not help you. The bank literally can't help you put your money where the bank is putting their money. But what they will do is they will tell you to put your money in the exact opposite place that they put their money. There's a problem, yeah. folks, and that's oh, a problem yeah. we've been brought up with. And it's a problem we all need to change quickly, which starts with getting control of your money. It's that simple. Definitely. You know, we've been all about be your own bank because, right, the bank, as you just said, the bank does the absolute different than what we do, right? They tell us to put your deposits in there, save it, keep it in there, right? The thing about the way a bank account set up, the more you keep in there per month, the less the fees you pay, right? But they don't give you anything in return for putting your money in there. You know, they give you nothing in return, right? That bank takes your money, loans it out, gets interest, right? Goes to you know another bank, loans, borrows that money, gets interest. Their money's always moving, but they want us to sit our money in there and let it sit. So, you know, I'm happy that today is a time where we are able to like help people realize that look, this is what your money's supposed to be doing. Your money's energy. It should be moving. It's currency. It's a current, right? You know, put it to work. And we're kind of changing that dynamic because, hey, you know, if I put my money in the bank right now, it's not doing anything. It's just sitting there, right? It's not even growing. Well, it's actually losing because if you really look at what's going on out there, the government, and it's no secret, everyone, I don't care what news station, anyone that's watching this looks at, the government is printing crazy amounts of money, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. And as they print money, every dollar they print 
takes a small little piece of your current money's value. In other words, what they're doing is they're technically devaluing your dollar by printing money, creating or, or exactly what they're trying to do. A lot of people don't understand inflation. People think inflation means that my cell phone's more expensive. The coffee I buy is just more expensive. No, what it actually is, is your dollars are worth less. So it takes more dollars to buy those same goods and services. And what the government wants to do, and here's a little unknown secret, the government wants to create inflation. A lot of people think, oh, the government doesn't want to create inflation. It's just, it's just happening. No, the government is intentionally trying to print money to create massive inflation. And here's why. It's no secret. The government's massively in debt, right? The deficit is huge. They can't technically pay that debt off, but they can if they devalue your dollars and their dollars so that they pay their debt off with weaker dollars later. Think about that. If you could pay your debts off today, or I'm sorry, in the future with money, with half the value of your current money, wouldn't that be awesome? Like if, if your debts were cut in half, not because of anything you did, but because you get to pay it back with weaker dollars, that would make a ton of sense. Well, that's why the government's doing what they're doing. So you're, and they're saying, you're saying the government's purposely devaluing your dollars. 100 percent. Right. They're they're intentionally. It's called modern monetary theory. Look it up. Anyone you can Google it. MMT, modern monetary mm -hmm. theory. It's an economic theory that's kind of now there's Keynesian, there's uh, Austrian economics, there's Chicago Board of Economics. There's all sorts of my study, all these. And folks, please don't put yourself to sleep by studying it. It's very dry and boring. But in order to do what I do, I have to understand why does the government do what they do? Why do the wealthy do what they do? And it really comes down to basic economics. So it's exactly what they're trying to do. They're printing, un, I don't want to say unnecessary money, but they're printing excessive amounts of money in an effort to really create inflation. And that inflation will devalue, the, well, that's what it is. They're devaluing the dollar because every dollar they print is more in circulation. And then what they can do is they can pay down their debts to other countries like China and, and Germany. They can pay it with weaker dollars because the US dollar is still the most powerful currency and still the most desirable currency there is. Okay. And that's not going to change anytime soon. People are like, oh, you know, the, the yen is going to take over the dollar. I doubt that's going to happen anytime soon, but the government does want inflation. What the government does not want folks is deflation. What you, me and Jory all want is deflation because you remember 2008, 9, 10, 11, you remember the whole market crash. It was the, you know, the great recession. How cool was it if you had money back then to be able to go out and buy real estate, right? Chris, I won't even lie. I've been like secretly praying. <laughs> right? I'm salivating, literally. I, like, sometimes I came into the market in 07. I got my license in 07, right? It was like, 07 was like today, right? So like, this is this is me. I walk around the house all day kind of like waiting for something to fall out, right? Waiting for the crash. That was because I came in 07, right? But, you know, I also know what's going on. The Fed, keeps, the Fed keeps propping stuff up, so we're good, right? But I came in 07 where it was just like this. There was lending like crazy. Prices were sky high, right? It just fell out. And I saw people buy up homes, right, for pennies on the dollar, right? I was selling them to investors. I didn't have to – I was buying some myself. But for pen, I'm talking about homes. I see homes right now. I'll see a house sell for $150,000 that I sold to somebody for six grand. Right, like like six grand. It's just like, oh my, can we go back to that, please? Right. So yeah, I mean, we we definitely want deflation, not not inflation, right? But uh, the government actually has a basis. I mean, you, you, the Fed talks about their inflation, their inflation rate they're trying to hit, right? They have a number they're trying to they're trying to hit this number of inflation yeah, per year. They are. Like, if you pay attention, they're telling you what they want. <laughs> you know, like they're telling you what they want to do it. So yeah, MMT is a real thing. Um, I'm like you. I study all. I study. A lot of YouTube pages where people just will fall. My wife falls asleep because I can't watch this stuff, you know. But oh um, my gosh, MMT. I mean, UBI, Universal Basic Income, right? That is a thing on the horizon that that goes with MMT. That hey, if we just pay everybody a basic income, it should produce more results, right? But it's been done in other country. It doesn't work, right? No. The, the, the UBI does not work, right? All that happens is you get higher asset prices on assets, and those who can buy assets make a lot of money. Those who can't end up becoming that, that lower class. What happens is the middle class is, disappears altogether, right? You go from having three classes where America was built out the middle class. The middle class built America, right? That's what built the, the, the boom of America was the middle class, right? We're going to the point where we're going to have the haves and the have-nots, you know? And that's why we keep preaching, you know, shut up and invest, creative financing, right? And uh, infinite banking, all the ways that you can get assets, right? Uh, you know, we're buying crypto, we're buying gold, we're, buying, we're just doing whatever we can to own assets. And like Ray Diallo says, cash is trash, right? We don't want to be having a whole bunch of cash in our pocket right now. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it's what you're saying. It's exactly why we do, you know, all these free previews that we do to teach people like how this works. You know, it's one thing to come on a podcast and teach, but you only have so much time. And then we do these longer trainings to teach people like, how do you invest in crypto the right way? How do you, you know, structure a portfolio so that it's all weather. And when the market drops, you actually make money. How do you do that? Like most people are like, well, you can't make money when the stock market drops. Really? All the wealthy do. They make double the money when the market drops, when all of us are taught to lose money because we are taught to do the opposite. And here's here's simplest way to put it. I love keeping things simple, stupid, Jory. Here is the easiest thing all of you can write down and remember. You want to make money investing, do these three simple things. Now, you ready? Write these down. Number one, buy low. That's simple. Yep. Just buy low. Number two, sell high. And number three, don't lose money. But you see, everybody's like, oh my God, that's so stupid. I heard that from Warren Buffett. Of course you did. But most people don't even listen to it. They think they understand it, but then the reality is they do the complete opposite. And let me give you an example. How many listening to this right now are buying stocks right now? How many of you are buying heavily into crypto? How many of you are buying into, you know, highly valued real estate? Now, this isn't everybody because there's still people like Jory and the experts that know how to buy low. But I'm just saying, how many of you are plowing money into the markets, into crypto, into real estate, thinking this, this parade's never going to end? You are actually doing the exact opposite of what I just told you Warren Buffett said is the three secrets to making money. You are actually buying high more than likely when the market drops. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jory, but what happened in 2008 and nine when the market dropped? Did people not sell low because of fear, because of reality and because of circumstances that were beyond their control? You're darn yeah. right. They had they bought highly appreciated assets. Those assets lost 30, 40, 50 percent of their value. They were forced to sell those assets and lose money. So if you were supposed to buy low, sell high and don't lose money, what you did is you bought high, you sold low and you certainly lose money. That's what people are doing right now. We're brainwashed into this euphoria that this is not going to end. And folks, it will and it will end abruptly. It will end harshly and it will hurt most people in America. And, you know, sometimes, and I hate to say this, it's their own damn fault because they, they're they literally into this state of euphoria called FOMO, fear of well, missing out. We think yeah, we're always yeah. missing out on something. Oh, my, <laughs> my neighbor's buying into the stock market. Why shouldn't I? My neighbor's, you know, flipping houses. I'm missing out. I got to get into this. Honey, we got to leverage our house and, and jump into this. And you know what? Listen, there's a ton of money right now to be made in real estate, a ton. If you play the game right short term, wholesaling is the number one thing people should be doing in real estate right now. But so many people, I just I see it on all my Facebook groups and I see them buying these giant mansions with these massive renovations. I'm like, man, good luck getting that done. I hope you I hope you can get it done because that's this that's what people are doing. They're they're just so think they're so wrapped up in this this euphoria that Unfortunately, that same euphoria existed in 2007. That same euphoria re existed every other recessionary period right before it happened. This is no different, folks, but you don't know how to prepare for it. And that's what people need to learn. Yeah, FOMO, man, FOMO can drive people crazy, right? Because, you know, it's, it's funny, right? Because, like, I was actually buying crypto in 2017, right? So I've been in crypto for a while, you know. And you know, I mean, I remember Do Doge, right? Dogecoin was like the coin to buy because it was like less than a cent, right? And so I got people texting me, "No, hey, should I buy Doge?" I'm like, "Dude, it just went up to forty cents from like zero. Don't touch it. It's <laughs> not know? even. It's it's, it's a right? joke. It was I crazy. Know? It was a joke. <laughs> you know? it, it, and this, I want to be clear. I'm not saying you can't make money off it because it's crazy times right now, right? Yeah. I'm just saying if you want to learn, if you want to have a long term investing plan, you buy off the fundamentals, right? So we're not saying don't buy real estate. I'm buying real estate every single day. But I'm still buying real estate at a discount, right? Either a discount of price or discounted terms. You know, I'm not looking to buy high end real estate. I'm not looking to do high end flips, right? Because that's when you get caught holding the bag, right? I buy stuff that I have multiple exit strategies at a price where, hey, if it all drops to the bottom, I can still run it out. I can still cash flow. You know, same with crypto. I don't like stocks. I'm, I'm completely out of stocks right now because the stock market is going crazy. It's been going down too for about two weeks, right? So I'm happy I got out when I got out, you know? So like just buy the fundamentals, you know, like buy the fundamentals. But it's always funny because people see it go up and they want to buy when it's up, right? <laughs> True story. My son who's in college called me, Paul, 
Should I buy Dogecoin? I said, what are you talking about? He's like, no, save your money. You can't even like, eat lunch right now. You're going to go buy Dogecoin because somebody you know, just told you they made a bunch of money off of it. When somebody else made a bunch of money off, off of it is when you wait. <laughs> you don't buy it right then. You know, So it's, it's, it's true, man. People are just going off of FOMO, and they're not actually buying off fundamentals. And that's what happened before. right? 07 was like this. right? If I bought a house today, I can flip it to Chris tomorrow. He can flip it to another guy the next day. right? But then the music stopped. And when the music stopped, the last guy holding the bag is the guy that got screwed, right? So, yeah, definitely we're trying to teach you ways where you can actually, you know, make money in a more safe way, right? But still make good money. When my son asked me, I said, you know what you should do? Watch this video. I sent him your video, Chris. I said, open up this account right now. Put money in this per month where you can get a guaranteed return. That's what you should do right now, right? And I told Chris, I had a Zoom call with my whole family. They were asking me about investing, right? I said, the first thing you should do. Because it's hard for me to tell people to go out and buy Bitcoin right now or go out and do this, if you're new especially, because, right, it's super, super high. So the first thing you all should do is open up a is open up a whole life policy and start putting money into that policy every single month, right? Yeah. That's what I said to do, first of all. <clears throat> and that's what we did the trainings prior to this one on, and that's what we're going to be doing. And everybody can see, you know, if you're watching this, you can see the moneyschoolrei.com forward slash preview. That's a free four-hour training that we're doing this Thursday. The tw I believe that's the 22nd, if I'm not mistaken, of this month, and it's free. And we're going to be teaching you all this stuff, how to set up your privatized banking, which is nothing more than that specially designed and engineered whole life. And that, you, you know, listen, like as soon as I say whole life, some of you are Dave Ramsey fans, as I am. I like Dave Ramsey. I just don't like some of his viewpoints on how close-minded he is, you know, but th there's a lot of that people that love Dave Ramsey and they say, oh, the whole life is a terrible place to put your money. That's because you don't understand what the wealthy do. You don't understand why banks, you know, continuously put their money in whole life at levels that, you know, are in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Last I checked, December 2020, banks had 180 plus billion dollars. And that was escalating very rapidly because banks know what's coming. They're exiting the markets. They're pulling their money out of all the things that you're putting money in. That's why you get corrections like today, 304. Big money moves out because they're ready to take their gains when everybody else is buying in. They're doing the opposite. Well, the same thing. The banks are telling you, buy stocks, buy mutual funds, buy ETFs, put your money in this CD, the savings account, You know, do this, do that. And then over here, what are they doing? rapidly putting their money in specially designed whole life policies, which are called bully. And if you don't believe me, just look at bully. <laughs> dirt bike. That's a nice dirt bike right there. Yeah, I'm in the mountains, man. Sorry about that. No, no, no worries. No worries. Um, but you know, it's, it's just, uh, you know, you gotta be very careful, whatever you're doing right now, you gotta be, you gotta be planning for what's coming because the people that don't plan are the people that lose it because everybody's like, Oh, I'll just sell out of the market when the market go, you know, goes down or when I start seeing it go down. Do you, do you realize if you played that game in last March, remember this is just last March in uh, COVID you would have lost 30% inside of just a, a week or two weeks. Do you realize that? Like how fast it happens is they something people don't understand because they yeah. wait and they wait and they wait for it to go up and then it gets up there. And then when it goes down, it goes down so fast. Most people can't react. Think of dominoes, right? It takes you a long time to set your dominoes up. Imagine that, right? Just in your mind, imagine the last time you set up dominoes or watch somebody do it. It takes hours to set up an elaborate domino. But then when you trigger that first domino, how quick do they all go down? <laughs> Done. Right? Just like that. That is the stock market, folks. The stock market works in the same rhythmic pattern as dominoes. It's triggers. One trigger goes, which is the first domino hitting the second. It triggers another and another at rapid speed. You can't keep up. If somebody says that to me, they're like, oh, well, I'm just watching it and I'm going to be very careful when it starts going down, I'm going to be out. So you're admitting that you're okay, that you're just going to sell low. Like if you just got out now, what are you going to miss out on? Maybe another 10% on the upside. Let's just say you miss out on 20% on the upside. This next drop, folks, this is going to be the big one, right? You always hear them talking about the big one. This will be the big one. Mark my word on that. And it's not going to be a 10 or 20% correction. It's more than likely going to be a 40, 50, 60% retraction from where it is now. Some are calling it the next great depression. Okay. Not recession. I didn't say that. The next great depression. Okay. And more than likely it will be. The question is, is are you ready? Do you know where to put your money? Do you know how to get ready for it? And do you know how to capitalize on exactly what's coming? Because you want to become a millionaire. Heck, some of you want to become multimillionaires, hundred heirs, billionaires. This is your opportunity. If you, if you can just 
learn the secrets of the wealthy and how to do this, which is what this preview is. Got it. So we're going to break down some of those secrets, Chris. Real quick, there's a question. Uh, one other question. Real estate bill said, but we can't all wholesale. Who are we going to sell to? That's a, that's right? a great. And what would you say to that? I mean, you're more of a wholesaler than me. Gotcha. I, and I'm not a wholesaler. I hate the word wholesaler. So okay, please. good. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> me too. I, was, I was trying to be nice here, man. <laughs> no, when wholesaling got big, I was like, please quit being wholesale, right? Wholesale is a verb. I'm an investor. We should all be investors. I do wholesale, right? I wholesale maybe two homes a month. The rest, you know, my model is we sell it on the land contract or contract for deed. We get, you know, we get cash flow, right? What I will sell though is this. This is what Chris said though. He said the majority of people are still out here buying homes, trying to flip them, right? Like they're still doing it. So like, we're just telling you that you should be the wholesaler, right? Who's wholesaling or like I say, creating, creating, you know, doing creative deals, create cash flow. But we, what I think we're both saying is don't be the guy that's doing these high-end real estate fix and flips right now because that's the market that gets screwed over, right? So like, yeah, we can't all wholesale. And guess what? The great thing is we're not gonna, we're not all going to wholesale, right? Because listen to this. I, I wholesale a lot of houses, right? There are certain buyers and investors who will never wholesale a day in their life. They just want you to sit in the deals. That's what they do. There's, a, there's an ecosystem, right? There's a ladder. There's a hierarchy to investors, right? We're telling you to make sure you're on the right side of the hierarchy so you're not stuck holding the bag when the music stops. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, to answer that real estate with Bill is, you know, one of the things you always have to have is that exit strategy. And you shouldn't just have one, a, you know, a traditional wholesale uh, deal has one exit strategy. The person puts it under contract, very minimal escrow money, if any, and then they try to find a buyer and their exit is either just let the deal, you know, go belly up or or wholesale it and sell it to another investor. That's, you know, I, I kind of gave you two exits, but really it's the same thing. But how we would do it is we would look at that deal and say, okay, if I can't wholesale that strategy number one, well, then I'm going to take it down and maybe I'm going to try to wholesale it. Okay. If I can't wholesale it, I'm going to renovate it and maybe I'm going to flip it. If I can't flip it, then I'm going to re I'm going to rent it out and then I'm going to take it to the bank or to another, you know, institutional lender that will give me long-term financing and I'm going to do what's called a burr. That's four, maybe even five exit strategies right there. How can you like not, you know, who are you going to sell it to? That, that right there answers it. Maybe yourself. Okay. Maybe you just keep the deal and do that, but you're right. You know, the person holding all of this at the end is the loser. So you got to be very, you know, very quick at what you're doing and always have multiple exits. Yeah. Cause I'll say, during, you know, during the last recession, the, the investor who was able to hold on to those properties, right. Then have to sell those properties to fire sell. Those are the people who made out, right. They were able to hold on to those through that time period, buy some more, hold on to them. Now they're selling like remember who's selling a lot of stuff right now. A lot. I talk to people on the phone every single day. A lot of people are selling, bought their homes in 2009, 10, 11 for dirt cheap, right? Now they're getting out the market, right? They're, they're leaving, right? That's why you have to understand who are your sellers. It's the same thing with the stock market, right? When somebody is selling Bitcoin at $62,000, they probably bought it at 11 or 12 and they're saying, hey, I'm good. I made enough. I, I had thousand X my money. Let me get out. Let the rest of these guys hold the bag. So that's all we're saying. We're just saying, make sure that you're being very, very, you know, safe right and i think what you said is that's so true is have multiple exit strategies right if you buy a deal only to flip it and you can't flip it you're stuck right if you buy that deal to say hey i, I could flip it or i keep it as a rental because you can always rent the property out i mean even if you even if you break even right at least you can rent that property out because the markets are cycles so we're saying when the market drops it won't drop forever it's going to drop for a time frame then come back up every deal you're buying just make sure that you can be able to weather whatever storm is going to come up come the way because I mean, we can keep saying, oh, it's not going to be over till this or that, but let's all be honest, right? There's always a correction. There's never been a time in life where a market went up and didn't correct, right? What goes up must come down. So there's going to be a correction. And the way it is now, the higher it goes up, the harder it falls. And, you know, let's, let's be honest, we've been living in a propped up economy for a few years now. So when it does fall, it's going to fall hard. So we're just saying, you know, make sure that you are prepared to be able to hold whatever you can do. So, you know, we're buying deals. We're, we're buying lots of deals. But every deal we're buying, we know that we can hold that deal throughout whatever comes our way. I, I love that you said that because it plays right into. So many of you would know a name, Cody Sperber, right? He's been in the game a long time. Well known as, you know, you guys might have a lot of different things you know him as, but wholesaling would be one of the things. I mean, we'll, we'll save the rest for kind of, you know, each of your own opinions. But <laughs> if you stand nice here, I'm trying to be very nice. Uh, go on to his Instagram and read some of his most current posts. And if you, you know, I don't follow him much, but it's not hard to understand what he's doing. 
He has been over the last two years exiting his real estate deals. He's been exiting all of his real estate holdings, becoming cash flushed, you know, and then, you know, obviously he's flaunting his cars and his houses, but he's becoming cash flushed because he is in the know. You know, he's gotten to a certain level where he's surrounding himself with very high profile, high net worth individuals, you know, that are telling him, hey, now is the time to sell. The market's hot. So I surround myself with the same group of people as does Jory. We, we surround ourselves around a campfire of people that are in the know, that are living the lives that we want. And these are multimillionaires, sometimes billionaires. Do you know what they're saying and what they're doing? Exiting. I've been selling off my portfolio very quietly, but I don't make any, you know, two ways about telling people. And some people think I'm absolutely nuts. I had 91 units, so I'm a small player, but I had 91 doors producing a heck of a cash flow. All properties that I bought from, let's just say 2011 straight through, you know, to a couple of, about two years ago when we were buying heavily and they were all doing great. The market hit these crazy levels. And I said, you know what? I don't know how I can't not sell. So I started listing them everyone going over offer over, over, over. And I'm just selling them off. And I just listed another five last week. And people are like, why would you sell them all off? That's your cash flow. Because if I get liquid when the market's high, when the market goes down, hey, listen, if the market's going to go down and let's just, you know, pretend it's two years, might be three, might be one, who knows? We can't time the market. But how long is two years from now? It goes by like that, folks. And if I've got all this cash and I move all my cash to my own private bank where I'm getting paid a guaranteed 4% plus dividend and I have access to that money, I'm just going to sit and wait and I'm going to loan money out on short term deals and keep that money moving. But I'm going to wait for this big opportunity. And when the market drops and keeps dropping, when everybody else is selling, I'm going to be like, I'll buy that 40 cents in the dollar. You got to sell that when you're going to lose that 30 cents. You know, like you see what I'm saying? Like, I hold the gold. And you guys have heard that. The, the, uh, what is this saying? You know, the person that holds the gold makes the rules. Well, exactly. Yeah. My terms at that point, but I don't need to basically go out there and negotiate. I have people coming at me because they're losing it because they didn't do what we're telling you to do. Now, again, there's no one size fits all. There's no silver bullet. What I'm doing might not be right for what you're doing. But again, having multiple different pieces and different things where you can put your money, we call them verticals, where you create cash flow, where your money's moving and where your money is all sitting, the, the one place, the one change you gotta make is where the money goes first. It's all guaranteed. Outside of that, where I put my money, as long as it's in motion, I can weather any downward force, any downward market. It doesn't matter because I can redeploy capital into deflating asset classes. And that is how you become stupid wealthy folks. You don't need to be smart. You don't need to even have a bunch of money. A lot of people might be like, oh, you can only do that because you had 91 doors and you're selling this up. Let's, you know, just like uh, Grant Cardone did that undercover billionaire. If somebody took everything I had away today, I would start back over tomorrow and I would know exactly how to go out and raise capital. And I'd know how to raise capital even faster in a downward market because money always flows to the safest place. I know where the safest place is. So if I needed to raise money for deals when the markets are falling apart, I know exactly how to raise it. But that's exactly what we teach. That's what that preview is going to show. It's going to show you where that money is, how to get it, how to solve people's problems, and all the secrets that you don't know because the it, uh, no disrespect to advisors. I was one for 16 years, but all the advisors, the bank brokers, the bankers, and everybody else is telling you to do the opposite because they need to get paid. And that's how they get paid by selling you. And again, don't hate me for this, but the big lie, because that's what it is. And you know it, but you're wearing the rosy colored glasses. All advisors do. And you're doing what you've been trained to do. And until you're not doing that anymore for a living, you can't take the rosy colored glasses off. I did that. No, wait. Or in 2018, when me and my wife got our HGTV show, I left being a financial advisor at a very high level at a, a heck of a, an income. I left it all. And when I did, I was able to take the glasses off and say, holy shit, what was I doing? Why was I telling people to do this when I'm doing the opposite? You see what I'm saying, folks? You got to you got to know the truth about money. Yeah. So let's break down some of those truths, Chris. All right. Let's, let's kind of give a little little advice now. Right. Because we've kind of told people, you know, and, and remember, we're not saying don't buy real estate because we're buying real estate. We're just saying be smart about how you buy real estate. Right. right. I mean, I've definitely, you know, 
added more filters to what I'm buying, right? And I'm also selling some stuff off too, right? Because you you don't take a profit until you sell too. So you, you know, I'll, I'll take some profits because I'll reinvest it when when I can get it for lower, you know. But um, you know, what are some of these things that people can do, right? Practical well, things. Yeah. How do we can start to control our money, right? How do we control our money? There's lots of them, but before we get into that, let's let's all get a good laugh because there's some breaking news that I want to play for you. You mind if I play a quick video? Everybody's gonna get a good laugh, but you're gonna learn one of those secrets. So let me play this real quick. Go ahead. Sorry, it just takes me a little bit with this one. Share audio. All right, folks, here's one of those tips. Good evening, folks. I'm Seymour Cash from MSTB Worldwide, and I'm joined here with my co-host, Anastasia. <laughs> and we have a breaking news story for you tonight. This story has me incredibly concerned. And there is an epidemic going on out there, folks, right now, and it's happening all around. And no one's even covering this. No one's paying attention to this epidemic. It's like hiding in the secret shadows. What's happening? It's called Fat Wallet. The wallet gains weight uncontrollably until the seams literally rip. It's initially undetectable until the damage is already done and then it's too late. The wallet must be replaced to hold all that cash. That really is unbelievable. You know, in fact, the scientists are telling us that there is a strong correlation between MSTV and the Fat Wallet. And we have a new report that shows that over 30% of our viewers are experiencing a 30% weight gain in their wallet, regardless of their spending habits. And I think this is going to lead to major health problems. Reports are showing hip problems, back problems, just pants problems. Pants are ripping. Oh, holes just out of the butts of their pants. Just Son of a bitch. This just in, Seymour Cash has checked himself into financial rehab. Thank you for tuning in to MSTV Worldwide. All right, folks. I know that's uh, <laughs> that's just supposed to get you to laugh. That's all it's supposed to do. But you know what? Let's talk about how we're going to get your wallet. Hey, Chris, what, are you, what are you doing doing this, man? You should be in Hollywood right now, right? Oh, like, my listen, anybody, that that, <laughs> <laughs> anyone that's not following me on YouTube right now, if you like that video, that's there's so many more videos that we're doing like that. We just recorded one this weekend that literally is for the record books. This one's going viral. It is ridiculous. It has characters. We got a ton of characters. Bubba Brown is in that one. Megan Moolah, Big Bang Frank's in that one. Infinite Banking Ian. And then we had a brand new character, which I'm not even going to announce yet, but you got to see it. It involves G-Wagons and Porsches and and yeah, anyway, if I didn't tell you enough to get you interested to subscribe to my YouTube, it's at the Chris Noggle. You got to check it out because I'll tell you, it'll get you laughing. But uh, yeah, let's jump into this. There's so many things we can cover with this. Where where do you want to start? I mean, I, I think, first of all, people are just kind of interested in saying, OK, how do I get control of my money? Right. So like we've already talked about replacing your money from the bank to the policy. Right. Um, so just kind of break down the process. Like how easy is that? How easy is it for us to control our money? Very easy, folks. You've been taught to put your money in 401ks, put your money in bank accounts, put your money where everybody else is in control of it. All you need to do, folks, is change one thing and change where the money goes first. So if this is your money, instead of depositing it into the bank and letting them make your mon make money on it and leaving it there, just change where it goes. Put it into your own bank where you're going to earn uninterrupted compound interest. But let's We've already talked about that. So I don't want to go too yep. deep down the privatized banking, but that's how you get control of your money first. But let's talk about other money. So let's start with one of the largest places where most American families have their wealth, your house, your primary residence. Like think about it. Stock, the stock market's been booming. Real estate's at all time highs across the country. Heck, even in Buffalo, New York, real estate prices are ridiculous. The average home, I don't know, I might be off, but seems like it's like 350 to 400. If I, if somebody had said the average home in Buffalo someday will be 350 or 400,000, I'd say, yeah, right. It never is going to be more than 150,000. And here we are. If, if somebody wanted to go buy a nice house, maybe 3,000 square foot, expect to pay 600,000 in nicer neighborhoods. That's unheard of. That's Buffalo, folks. What about Texas, Florida, all these other places where people actually want to live? Real estate values have, <laughs> have gone way up. 
That's funny. No, that's, that's funny because I'm, you know, I'm in a lot of smaller markets and it's crazy right now. So like case example, we had a lady call back today. We offered three grand for a house. I still buy houses underneath that, you know, hundred thousand dollar mark, but we offered three grand for a house in May. She turned us down. She called back today and said, Hey, I want 10 grand. I said, Hey, lock it up. I don't, I don't care what it takes. Lock it up because those houses just from last May, I mean, it's, it's a double, triple increase in prices for homes, right? Because they're going, they're being bought like crazy, right? So, and you probably know, but let's talk about the institutional buyers that are buying real estate right now, right? Oh, the institutional yeah. buyers, the hedge funds that are buying single family real estate to turn into rentals, right? They're, they're doing that. So you guys know of iBuyers. That was a couple of years ago. You heard about that. Now they've kind of gone underground and they're doing it through Zillow and all these other buying groups that you're seeing. Like folks, you know who those are? It's Wall Street. It's hedge funds. They just don't want you to know that. They're buying up all the real estate because they know that they can rent it out and because they're exiting Wall Street. They're exiting their money out of stocks because they know what's coming and they want to put their asset, their money in safe places like real estate. So why, uh, again, with real estate, let's get back to where all your money's sitting. Real estate. Where is it? It's in equity in your house. But the funniest thing is, I can't tell you. We talked to hundreds of people, but I can't tell you how many of these people that we talked to say that they've got a ton of equity in their house. And then I ask them, or, or sometimes they're like, yeah, my house is paid off. I'm like, great. You know, do you have a line of credit? Are you accessing that cash? No, I, I wanted to pay off all the debt. But, and I'm like, wait a second. So you're living in a house that has $300,000 in equity. And you just told me that you've got a bunch of credit card debt. You're struggling in certain ways, but you're psyched that your house is paid off. That's like, you know, I come to your party that you're having when you pay your house off. You've you just paid your house off and you have this big party, you know, celebrating the payoff of your house. And I come for the, the appetizers in the cold beer. But in that mist of where you're talking, I come up to you and I say, hey, you know, let's just pretend it's Bill. Hey, Bill, congratulations on paying your house off. Can I ask you a question, Bill? Sure. First off, Bill, thanks for the beer. It's, it's great. Uh, let me ask you that question. What has changed in your life since you paid your house off? And Bill says, um, I don't have a mortgage payment. I'm like, yeah, yeah, but, but are you taking more vacations, Bill? Like, did you pay off? Did you like, where, where else are you? You're not driving a newer car. It's the same car you had before. Like what's changed? I don't have a mortgage payment. You see the problem with people paying their houses off or the people that just have excessive equity in their house is your money is sitting there in your house being lazy. Now I want you to envision a really bad day that you had at work. You had just gotten home. It's eight o'clock at night. It's almost dark. You're so exhausted because you just had the hellacious day. You open your front door and you look over into your living room and right there on your couch is your money. Literally, just envision your money. It's just sitting right on your couch. It's drinking your soda. It's eating your potato chips and it's watching your TV and it's laughing and having a good old time, making a mess. You're, and you look over and your money looks back at you with a big shit eating grin on its face and it says, what, did you have a hard day? Your money is sitting lazy on your couch because you're allowing it to. Here's what wealthy people did. Now, most of them did this back in uh, you know, the beginning of COVID when this first started. They got lines of credit on their houses. Why? Well, because why wouldn't you? If you've got equity in your house, why wouldn't you have a line of credit on your house? It's kind of foolish just to have that money sitting there doing nothing. At least tap into it. Some people will say, oh, I, I don't qualify for a line of credit. That's why I don't have one. Well, have you ever heard of Quantum RE? There's private investor groups out there that will give you the equity in your house for no debt and no monthly payments. You just aren't in the know. We teach that at this preview too. But I'm just saying like that equity can be extracted in use. Now, some of you might say, well, I yeah, I have a line of credit, but I don't know what to do with it. I don't want to remodel the kitchen. I don't, I don't know what to do with it. Great. Let's talk about what to do. Most people have credit card debt or some bad debt. What if we took that line of credit money Okay, which right now you can get lines of credit for two, three, maybe 5% interest. Take that and pay off your visa at 20%. You literally just made the spread. If it's 5% the line of credit costs you and it's 20% you were given to visa, you realize you just put 15% back in your pocket. Take the amount you were given visa every day and just redirect it back to your home equity line or get that line of credit and start using it for marketing, start using it for real estate, start using it to invest in whatever you are, or don't do anything with it and wait. But here's the problem with waiting. People that have lines of credit, wait till it's too late. Now, back in March and April of last year, remember that was COVID when everything was falling apart, the world was ending. You guys all remember that it was only a year ago. Myself, 
And all the, the people that I'm talking about, these wealthy individuals, all what we did is we all talked about it. And we said, hey, what should we do with these lines? Because what's going to happen next is the bank is going to freeze these lines of credit. The bank is in control of your line of credit if the money's sitting at that in, in that bank, right? They're in control. So we took all of our money out of the bank. You know, I took it all out. I took this line, that line, that line. I maxed them all out. But see, then here's where people make the mistake. They max out their line of credit. They put it in the same damn bank's account. <laughs> So you, yeah. you have a Bank of America a home equity line of credit, and then you're like, oh, my God, things are getting bad. I'm going to take all this money out because that's what Chris and, and Jory said to do. And you put it back in Bank of America's bank account. You didn't get control. Here's what you got to do. Take two additional steps. Take the money out of the bank and shuffle it. You remember the old cup game? Take that money and put it in different banks. Go down the strip and, and find different banks. Okay, great. I'm going to put it in that one. Oh, credit union. Great. I'm going to put some here. Oh, community bank. I'm going to put some there. Spread that money out. Play the cup game. So when Bank of America is like, oh, we're going to call this line of credit. You'd be like, All right, money's gone. Sorry. And, and don't keep it at the same bank. Like that is how you prepare. Because then when these buying opportunities happen, because things are falling apart and deflating, your money is spread out over four, five, six banks. Doesn't matter how many. And now when you need to get the cash to buy these assets that are 50 cents on, you know, on the dollar, like they were in 08 and 09, you just literally get in your car and stop at all the banks. And every time you stop at the bank, don't forget to get your lollipop. Remember, each bank has a little cup above where the teller is that has lollipops, different flavors. Get a different flavor at each one. Ignore the wrapper because you're beating the bank. The wrapper says dum-dums, but you're not <laughs> the dum-dum because you're playing the game. And just enjoy the sucker. So anyway, I'm I'm done with that. You got to move your money, folks. You got to take whatever capital you have, whether it's money you've saved in your private banks or somewhere else, or money that the bank is willing to give you today. And you got to protect that stuff. And you got to be yeah. ready to strike when it goes down. And the key to that too, though, Chris, is because like appreciation, right? Because that that line of credit comes from equity, right? Appreciation, right? Appreciation is like a it's a myth. It's there right now. It might not be there tomorrow. Right. So like people wait and they wait and they wait. It might not be there tomorrow. It can be gone. Right. So you might as well use it today when you can use it. Right. That's why we say go get a line of credit right now. Right. Move it along. Move it out to different banks and then have it there available to be using. Because what happens is when equity disappears, that's when you go shopping. <laughs> when the equity is not house anymore. Right. Then you go shopping with the equity that you have before. So, yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with that. But that's not what people do. You see, like, uh, I don't know, let's just pick on a luxury brand, uh, Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton's got, uh, you know, all their stuff. It's always full price and people line up down the hall to buy that stuff at full price. But then Louis Vuitton puts a half off sign on those bags. Most people are like, ooh, there's something wrong. Like, I don't want that at half off. I wanted it at full price, but now it's half off. I don't want that. The line diminishes. Now, I know that's not what would really happen, but I want you to envision that because that's exactly what people do. They want to pay full price because it feels good. FOMO, missing out. Oh, my God, they only have five more bags. I got to get in line and get that bag. I got to get in line and get that Mac, that MacBook. You know, folks, they're making more of those things. Don't let them fool you that they've only got five left. But then when it goes on sale, you're like, ooh, I, I don't know, man. It's, why is it on sale? Is something going on? Is you know, like. That's when you should be buying it. And I, I know that's fictitious and not really how it works, but that's how people act, especially in times like this where we think it's never going to end. So you're absolutely correct. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. I mean, listen, if you don't take the equity out, they will call your note due, right? What happened What happened in 2011, 2012? The reason why the market dropped even more, everybody's line of credits got called, right? So whatever they weren't using, they got called. And whatever was out, they got called, you know, they got called due, right? So while the equity is there, use that money. Again, money is energy, right? It has to be moving and moving and moving and moving. Your house has created a ton of equity from you bought it, right? Use that equity, but don't use it to buy TVs and cars. Use it to buy more assets that bring in more income, right? That was the issue before. We would take a line of credit to go buy the brand new flat screen TV or the new furniture or the brand new, you know, Mercedes. No, go out and buy that house that can give you back four hundred dollars per month cash or after whatever you pay for your line of credit. That's how you use your equity. <laughs> And crypto, like, you know, that, that's been a hot thing, you know, Dogecoin, crypto, Ethereum, all these things. You know, did you know that Dogecoin right now, by today's valuation, is worth more than Ford motor car? Like, yeah, put that crazy. in perspective, folks. You guys all do know that Dogecoin was a joke. Was It was supposed to be like a laughing thing. Like, it was created as a joke, and it's now worth more than Ford. Like, think about what's really going on out there, folks. But you just got to wrap your head around this, and you got to see through the thick of what's happening and you got to actually do the opposite.
because that's what the wealthy are doing, but they're not telling you about it because what's in it for them to tell you about it? Nothing. Why am I telling you about it? Because that's just what I do. That's my line of work. I teach people the truth about money and to do the opposite. But if you don't know what to do, that's the problem. The other thing too, like in, in uh, COVID when it happened, a lot of people lost their jobs. And a lot of people, when they lost their jobs, they packed up their office, packed up all their pictures of their family, put them in the box and they left never to come back. But what most people don't take with them when they leave a job is their money. They leave their money in that old 401k because they're just like, well, I don't know what to do with it. Like that is the most irresponsible thing. And I can't understand why people wouldn't take that money, roll that money into a self-directed IRA. It's keyword, self-directed. It's no different than your regular IRA or Roth IRA. It's just you have the ability to do anything you want with that self-directed IRA. You can take that money and lend it out to Jory on his next real estate deal. Probably would be a good thing to do if he actually needs your money, but you could lend it to Jory. You could take that money and you could do all sorts of things. Heck, if you wanted to go buy a dairy cow, and I did say a dairy cow, and you wanted to bring that dairy cow home, put it in your garage, feed it, and then every morning go out there and milk that dairy cow. And then you take that bucket of milk out to the front of your house and you literally sell fresh cow milk until you get arrested for doing that. You probably make a good amount of money. You can't do that with your regular Fidelity or Vanguard IRA, but you can do that with your self-directed IRA. I don't suggest buying a dairy cow, but I just want you to understand the difference. It's the difference of control. When someone tells you what you can invest in and how much and how many, whatever, and all the rules, that is you not being in control of your money. When you can actually go buy a dairy cow, when everybody else says it's stupid, but because you think you've got a way to make money off milk in the cow, you are in control. Again, I'm not saying that might be not, that's not the smartest thing to do, but control is the smartest thing because when you're in control, you can do anything you want. When everybody else is in control, like the bank in control of your home equity line and the equity in your house, the bank in control of your bank account. Oh, people tell me this all the time. I get people mad at me when I tell them they're not in control of their bank account. I'm in control of my bank account. I can go into that bank anytime and get my money. Really? Okay. So obviously you didn't go to the bank last April, May, June, July, or August. And I think it went all the way to September because if you did, you couldn't have got all your money out of the bank. Oh, yes, I could have. I could have went in there and taken withdrawals for all my money. They would have given it to me. Nope. Try it. Try it next time. Try it in 2009. Try it back in, in April or May or any of those months just a year ago. And then when this whole thing happens again, try doing it. You're not in control of your money. The bank's in control of your money and the bank loves it because they're making money on your money while they're just dishing you back all the products and services that you want, the lines of credit, the, the mortgages, the credit cards. They're giving you all that stuff back and you're gladly paying monthly checks to them every month. 5, 10, 15, 20, 29% interest rate. And you don't even see a problem with that. Folks, you're giving away all your wealth when you need to take back all the money that you give away. One change changes all that. So and another thing, Jory, let's, the, the, another place where a ton of money sits, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of right now, about 40, don't, don't fight me on the, the amount, but I think it's like 44 or $45 trillion sits in employer-sponsored retirement plans, commonly known as 401ks, 457s, 403bs, and all different names. How many of you listening to this have one of those right now? And what do you do? Well, blindly and kind of aimlessly, you just, every paycheck, money just goes into that 401k and you're like, whew, I'm gonna have a boatload of money when that day of retirement comes someday in the future, five, 10, 15, 20 years down the line. Yeah, you might, but that money, when you get it out, is going to be taxed at a much higher rate than it is today. Number two, that money, when you take that money out sometime in the future, will be worth a lot less than it is today. Number three, all those opportunities for that period of time from when you're putting money in the 401k to the time when you actually take it out, I want you to count all the missed opportunities. I want you to count all the houses that you could have bought during that time with all the money that's in your retirement account that you couldn't because, oh, I got a lot of money, but it's in my 401k and I don't want to pay taxes and penalties on the money hear this all the time. You are not in control of your money. You have bought into this fictitious thing called retirement. And it's not fictitious, but it really, the idea of it is really self, it's self-defeating. And in doing that, you're literally doing the complete opposite thing that you should, because you're giving up control of your money for some future goal that may or may not happen on speculation. And it's funny because people do things with their money. They would never do with things that money buys. You wouldn't go buy a car 
and wait five, 10 or 15 years to drive the car. You wouldn't buy your dream house for your significant other or your, your, your husband or wife. And then the day you're about to move into the dream house, you tell them, oh, honey, 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 whoa, sweetie, we can't move into this for five, 10 or 15 years. Remember the rules? They told us we have to put our money away for the future. You don't do that. Like you don't buy food at the grocery store and wait five, 10 or 15 years to eat it. But why do you do that with your money, folks? I'm, I get so fired up on this because it's so logical, like what I just said, that you would never do that. But you do do that every day with your money. It's, it's just mind boggling that they've got us so well trained to do well, what they Chris, want. To do. They're going to match it, right? I mean, this is what you hear. Okay. If I put it in there, my employer matches it for me, right? I can't, I can't lose that. Right. This is free money. <laughs> of course. And, you know, I, I'm going to pat everybody on the back that is putting money into a 401k, you know, and you're getting a match. But how many of you can honestly look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm only putting into my 401k up to the amount that they give me in match? How many of you can actually say that? Well, no, I'm putting a percent more. Oh, I'm putting 10 percent more. Right. Yeah, like, but you're doing it because of the match. Right. Oh, and the tax deduction. Oh my goodness gracious. I'm going to get into the taxes in a second, but you're doing that. Now, if you're putting in it up to just the match, good for you. That's actually not a bad idea because you're getting free money. And if me, Jory, we can't give you free money, but I still want you to think about a loaf of bread, right? Match, no match. But let's say you went to the store and you bought a loaf of bread. You come home, you put it in your freezer and you shut the door. And then you wait five, 10 or 15 years and you open the freezer door. And instead of one piece of bread, you have two because they gave you a match. You have now two freezer burned loaves of bread. Would you eat those? You wouldn't eat those loaves of bread, even though you have two of them because they gave you a match. You wouldn't eat them because they're it's not edible. But that's what yeah. you do with your four hundred one k. You you you're doing it because of a match. Yeah, I think I think the other issue too is I don't know this, but you know, a lot of people who are putting in the four hundred one k for a match, right? They're not diversified, right? They're just investing in the four hundred one k for the match, and they're nowhere else. Because I mean, let's let's be honest: most wealthy people aren't putting money in their four hundred one k. They're putting it in places that give them a higher return in the four hundred one k, right? So what happens is you put in the four hundred one k for match, to match, to match. And you're doing it for years, and you're seeing it go up, and it goes up, and it goes up, and it goes up, and then it goes down, right when you need it, right? Right when you're ready to take it out, it goes down, right? Then it's stuck there, right? So what we're trying to say is you you had no control over, it, right? So you weren't able to. You can move it out to stuff like that, right? Or you know do the match and put some more over here, put some more over here where you have more control Absolutely. over it because we don't want to see you get stuck where all your money is sitting in the four hundred one k. That then when you want it, the market changed, the market dropped, and now it's gone. And and what you just said, I mean, we've covered a lot of ground here, folks. And again, we're going to cover a lot more at this free preview on Thursday. But think about the places where people's money are. We already talked about the equity in their house, lots of cash sitting there, but people are letting it be lazy. Then the second largest or maybe first largest is retirement plans where you can't access the money without penalties and fees. And then the third place people's assets are right now is in the stock market because they're making a ton of money. And I just heard this, right? And, and hopefully this guy's not listening and I won't use his name, but he had over $3 million. Like he, he's, you know, uh, he's a, uh, I don't think he was an engineer, but he was an engineer, engineer like per minded person. So he had all his money in the stock market. He'd done really well, had tons of gains, um, invested for the long haul. And we're having a discussion about the privatized banking, about making changes. And, you know, we get down to it. Uh, how much do you want to put into it? And he's like, well, I, I don't know. I'm putting, you know, I've got all this money in stocks. I'm like, great. You know, like, how do those look? Well, I got a ton of gains. I'm like, perfect. Like, this is this is like a dream come true for people. And then he says this to me. And he says, yeah, but if I take the money out, I have to pay tax on it. And I kind of looked at him and I'm just like, well, yeah, you know, it's an unqualified account. You made a bunch of money. Like, should I pat you on the ass or on the back and say, good job, man. You made a bunch of money. So yeah, you got to pay the piper a little bit. You got to pay that 15% or 20% capital gain. Like that's a good thing. And he says, oh, I, I don't want to pay taxes on this money. And you know what? I, I didn't say this to him and I regret not saying this, but here's what I should have said to him. The best advice I could have given him. Awesome. You know, I am so proud that you've made that much money in the stock market. And, you know, I understand you don't want to take it out because you don't want to pay taxes, but I have, I have a great strategy for you. How about I tell you how you never have to pay tax in any of those stocks? How, how about that? Wouldn't that, would you like that? Oh my God. Yeah. You know how to do that. You know how I can, how I can not pay tax in this? I said, sure. Heck yeah, man. I'm America's number one money mentor. Of course I know how to not pay taxes. 
follow with me. Here's all you do. Keep the money in the stock market like you have this whole time. It, it will keep, probably keep going up for the next little while. And then all of a sudden, the market's going to shift and it's going to go down rapidly. And it's going to go down and down. And that's when I want you to really watch your cash and your stocks. Okay, I want you to watch them. Now, I need you to chart how much money you paid for these, what your cost basis is. And when your the stock market drops so much that your stock is now worth less than what you paid for it, sell it. And then what you've got yourself is a no tax situation. You didn't have to pay tax on any of those stocks. And you even get a tax write off that can be carried forward for several years. Man, how do you like that advice? <laughs> That's funny, man, because yeah, we complain about taxes. And believe me, we're all trying to avoid paying as much tax as we can. But you usually pay tax when you make money. <laughs> I mean, it kind of. I hate to say know, that. Make, Move to Puerto Rico. Right, <laughs> move to Puerto Rico if you want to avoid paying income tax. Oh, that's a whole different show that we can talk about, Chris. We're not gonna do that right now, but yes, no, <laughs> just saying. I do, I, I do have a way where you cannot pay tax on any of those gains or any dividends or anything, but you know, we'll bring on some more tax experts for that. But that is true, right. there, are, there are ways, but like you know, like think yeah. about that. Like, how many of you want that strategy that I should have given that guy? None of you, but like, that's the way people think, like, you, our mindsets are whacked. Because we've been trained to have messed up mindsets. We've been trained to believe the big lie about money when what they're doing and what, you know, I keep saying the wealthy and I'm not pigeonholing the wealthy as being bad. They just know what you don't know. But the thing is, is you can learn exactly what they know. You can do exactly what they do. You don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to have a whole bunch of money. You just need to know how to use the money you have. And I don't care how much that is. I don't care if it's 500 a month that you have to save. I don't care if you've got $10,000 in a bank account and you're like, I don't have that much. I can't do much with it. I can show you how to make more money on the money you have. I don't care how much it is. And you wouldn't believe it. And I can show you how to do it without working any harder, without working any longer, without taking on any additional risk and without losing control of your money. Now, do I have your attention? Sign up for the free event Thursday. I'll teach you exactly what we know. And we'll bring on some multimillionaires that will teach you what they know so they can you know, show you exactly how simple this really is. That the biggest thing people say to me, Jory, you've heard me say this a bunch of times. That sounds too good to be true. Yeah. That sounds no, too I mean, good to be true. That's what you always hear. But it's, I mean, this is the truth. You know, I've been doing it since uh, December. Great results. So it's not too good to be true. It's just, you know, we're, our brains have to be unlearned. We have to unlearn what they taught us, right? <laughs> that, that's all yeah. it starts with. Unlearn what they taught us, you know? Yeah. Cool. So yeah. Uh, before we go, Chris, I mean, give us one, you know, one big thing right now that people can take away that they're going to learn uh, this Thursday, Thursday training. Wow. Only one? Okay. Um, you are going to learn how you can, let's see, how you can use your money, all, almost all of your money, how you can use it all while still getting paid interest on that money. So essentially I can show you how you can take your money, put it somewhere, earn interest on it while you still have access to take it all out and not interrupt the interest you're earning and then use that money to invest in crypto, real estate, marketing, you know, whatever your game is, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. But then what we're going to do is we're going to show you when the right time is to invest in all of those different things based on very factual, or very factual, predictable patterns that are going on right now. We're literally going to tell you exactly how to invest, when to invest within, you know, you can't time the market, but with certain things. And then we're going to teach you how to use self-directed IRAs. We're going to teach you how crypto works and all the different things that go along with Bitcoin and everything else, but we're not going to be selling you anything that comes along with that. I want to be very clear about this training. What you're going to learn is what you need to learn. What we're not going to be doing is selling you a crypto course, selling you a, a flipping course, selling you a wholesale course. None of that. Okay. Yeah. We're just going to be teaching you. And if you want more, then there's a three day training you go on and it costs a whole whopping 297 bucks. Okay. But this event Thursday is free. So if you want to earn uninterrupted compound interest on your money while still having access to it, that's nobody knows how to do that. If you want to learn how to make money by taking back the money that you're giving away to everybody else without working harder, longer, without giving up control or taking on any risk, this event will teach you that. If you want to learn how to use self-directed IRAs, solo Ks, and how to be a private lender, we'll show you how to do that. And we'll also show you how to reposition the current assets you have, no matter what they are, in different places so that you don't have to worry about riding the roller coaster in the markets 
And I'll even give you a bonus round. Okay. One bonus round that we're going to give you is we're going to show you, we're going to show you exactly when this whole thing's going to unfold, why it will unfold. I'm going to do like a bonus session in here and exactly how to be ready for that. And then what you're going to, there I can see it in the free preview, but in the three day, if you choose to join us, we're going to have Harry Denton. Look him up. Harry Dent Jr. He's a oh, world, renowned, it, yeah. world renowned leading economist. And yeah. he is going to tell you his thoughts about what's coming and how to prepare. And very last thing I might give you at this preview is I'll tell you how to position your assets, okay, your 401ks, your IRAs, how to position them for exactly what's coming and how to make money all the way up to when it happens. And when it does happen, how you can potentially have your assets increase 30 to 40% through a little, but uh, a very well known, but little taught strategy that will basically not involve any risk in a guaranteed way. And I'm not talking about privatized banking. So if that didn't just get your attention, then just don't come, <laughs> then just don't come to the, pri the, the preview because <laughs> I got nothing else. Yeah, I, got, I got many of Harry Dent's books, really, really, really good economic, you know, economist talks a lot about demographics and changes in demographics and how, you know, demographic changes affect the economy. So just having that information in there is big time. So there's a question right there, Chris, if I'm not available Thursday, will there be a replay? Absolutely. So we're going to send a replay out to every single person that registers. But if you don't register, you can't get the replay. Yep. So you don't have to be available Thursday. Hey, some people have other things to do. Maybe a little one to watch. Doesn't matter. We'll send you the replay if you register. The link's right on the bottom. There you go. Got it, man. Well, hey, Chris, I appreciate it again coming on with us, man. The thing with us is like we can talk about money. We can get really deep about stuff and keep going for hours and hours. But I think that, you know, You've been able to keep giving us some little nuggets here and there, right? And you've helped me along the way with some stuff that, I, that I've changed already that I'm seeing a great, great you know, return from. So I'd advise everybody to sign up for that uh, free preview, join them on Thursday, right? Get some of these tidbits, give them a call if you're ready for your you know, whole life policy. He set mine up, he set up my family members, he sent up friends, right? We we're all having a good time with that. So, hey, we appreciate you, Chris. As always, guys, like, subscribe, share these videos, tell your family, tell your friends. And as always, shut up and invest. Thanks, man.